Today's video is brought to you by NordVPN. More on them in a bit. Allied propaganda posters during World War II frequently featured the caricatures of the three Axis leaders. The German one with the moustache, the big jawed Italian, and the stern, bespectacled Japanese general. The association was intended to portray the latter as the Japanese equivalents of the other two totalitarian leaders. In reality, Prime Minister, War Minister, and Army Chief of Staff Hideki Tojo was never an absolute ruler. Even though he concentrated considerable political and military power into his hands, he was never a dictator akin to the Fuhrer or the Duce. His authority was always subordinate to Emperor Hirohito's, and it was frequently undermined by political opponents. Nonetheless, his responsibility in initiating the Second Sino-Japanese War and extending World War II to the Pacific Theater is unquestionable. As head of both the Japanese government and the Japanese military, he would ultimately be accountable for the brutal treatment of civilians and prisoners of war. But before we get to the end of Tojo's story, let us explore his rise to the top. Hideki Tojo was born on December 30th, 1884, in the Oate Prefecture, Honju, Japan. He was the third son of Hidenori, an imperial army officer, and Chitose Tokunaga, a daughter of a Buddhist priest. Hideki's two older brothers died at a young age, making him the eldest son in the family. As such, he grew up rather spoiled by his parents, but he endured strict discipline at school. By his own admission, he was never a particularly gifted student, but he compensated for his lack of talents with sheer determination. This attitude to schoolwork provided him with an excellent memory for detail and almost manic obsession for procedure and discipline, which would serve him well in later life. After finishing school, Hideki joined the military academy, graduating in 1905 as a second lieutenant in the cavalry. The Russo-Japanese War had just concluded with a victory for Japan, and Hideki was commissioned too late to join in the fight. His father, Hidenori, had served with the rank of general, but was repatriated with a case of beriberi, a severe deficiency of vitamin B1. This disease was indicative of the poor diet of Japanese soldiers and a, a reflection of the poor logistics of Tokyo's military. An obsession with securing resources would impact Tojo's later decisions. In 1909, Hideki married his fiancée, Ito Katsu, a rather progressive move on his part. Ito was a college student, unusual for Japanese women at the time, and the marriage had not been arranged by their parents. The couple was apparently a happy one, and they eventually had seven children. Young officer Tojo furthered his military education by attending the Army Staff College, graduating in 1915. Three years later, Tojo served briefly in Siberia without seeing any combat. This operation was part of the anti-Bolshevik Allied intervention in the Russian Civil War, an experience that developed Tojo's anti-communist positions. In fact, he identified Russia and later the Soviet Union as Japan's main antagonist in East Asia. After his tour of duty in Siberia, Tojo traveled to Germany as a military attaché in 1919. While there, he was strongly impressed by the concept of total war, espoused by General Erich Ludendorff. To oversimplify, this approach involved converting industrial and agricultural sectors to full-scale military production in times of war. On his long way back to Japan, Tojo crossed the United States by train in 1992. As a fanboy of industrial production, he should have been impressed by the potential of the US in this department, and yet Tojo's impression of America was of a rich yet decadent country, ill-suited for a total war effort. And his dislike of the US was heightened in May 1924, when the American Congress passed the Johnson-Reed Act, which severely restricted immigration from Asian countries. In the following years, Tojo dedicated all of his time to administrative work within the army, barely seeing his children. His pen always truly mightier than his sword, it seems, and in 1928 he received a promotion to colonel and an appointment as bureau chief for the army. It was in this position that he received the nickname Kamasori, or The Razor, a nod to his ruthless bureaucratic efficiency. While in this capacity, the Razor networked with young officers, and in May 1929, they created a study group called the One Evening Society. Its members sought to modernize the Japanese military according to the German model of total war. They antagonized the descendants of ultra-conservative noble families who traditionally had disproportionate influence over the army staff. These traditionalist groups in the early 1930s merged into the Imperial Way Faction, or Kodoha. They promoted worship of the Emperor Hirohito, despised the involvement of economy and industry in warfare, emphasized fighting spirit above all, and advocated for the army to overthrow the civilian government. Tojo and his one evening friends instead supported the opposing control faction, or Tosiha. They were also staunchly loyal to the emperor, yet they argued that the military had to cooperate with civilian institutions as well as the economic and industrial elites. An inevitable confrontation began brewing.
Colonel Tojo continued his steady rise within the army ranks, heading the military investigation departments within the Ministry of War in 1933. The following year, he received a promotion to Major General and an appointment as Commandant of the Military Academy. In March of 1934, the ever diligent and studious Tojo authored an essay in which he fused the notions of fighting spirit with the concept of total war. In this piece, he argued that the Japanese had superior willpower compared to their potential enemies, especially the Soviet Union, the United States, Britain, and France. This superior willpower should have been applied to all aspects of society. The economic, political, and military sectors had to work in cooperation to secure future victories. The only way to ensure such coordination was through a monolithic, near-totalitarian state. So far, Tojo had written a lot about war without ever fighting in one. He soon, though, would have a taste of a more operational command when, in September of 1935, he was appointed head of the Kampeitai in Manchukuo. You see, the Japanese Empire had occupied areas of Manchuria, northeastern China, since the Russo-Japanese War. During the 1920s, a government-backed corporation developed the South Manchuria Railway in the region. On September the 18th, 1931, a tract of the railway was blown up ostensibly by Chinese troops. But the incident was a false flag attack designed to justify a Japanese occupation of Manchuria. On March the 1st, 1932, the occupied area became the puppet state of Manchukuo. Manchukuo always governs with an iron fist by the Kwatung Army, a large detachment of the Imperial Japanese Army, which over time became almost independent from Tokyo. The Imperial Army included a unit called Kampeitai, present also in Manchukuo. Sometimes described as the Japanese Gestapo, the Kempeitai was a military police. Under Tojo's direction, the Manchukuo Kempeitai became the efficient arm of a police state, which he would put to good use in February 1936. On the 2nd of that month, the rivalry between the Imperial Way and the control factions within the army came to a head when a group of Imperial Way young officers tried to overthrow the government. The Minister of War, General Araki, feared that the mutiny could extend to the Kwatung Army and ordered its Chief of Staff, General Itagi, to take preemptive measures. And Itagaki set his razor to work. Tojo was opposed to the Imperial Way, but on a personal level, he was friends with one of the coup's leaders, Colonel Nagata. And he confessed privately to his wife that he was moved by the tragedy of the rebels, whose act was doomed to fail. Nonetheless, Tojo obeyed his superior's orders and unleashed the Kempeitai, identifying and arresting any officer suspected of being in cahoots with the coup. The February mutiny was utterly crushed both in Japan and Manchukuo, and Tojo's swift action had impressed his superiors back in Tokyo. In January 1937, he received a further promotion to a lieutenant general, and in March, he replaced his old boss, Itagaki, as chief of staff of the Kwantung Army. General Tojo had designs of his own now that he led a large force bordering the feared and hated Soviet Union. In June 1937, the Soviets had occupied the Kanchatsu Islands on the river Amur, marking the border with Manchukuo. Tojo immediately ordered one division to retake control of the disputed islands. This was a hostile act against a bordering foreign power and completely unsanctioned by the government, by the way. In fact, the army general staff not only didn't approve, they overruled Tojo's orders. But the razor was not done with clamoring for war. With a cooler head, he reasoned that a war with the Soviet Union would have been unsustainable with a hostile China south of Manchukuo. On June the 9th, 1937, Tojo dispatched a telegram to the War Ministry erasing the alarm about the buildup of forces under Chinese nationalist leader Chiang Kai-shek. He advised urgent action to be taken before the Chinese became too strong. Less than a month later, on July the 7th, Sino-Japanese tensions erupted at Nikou Chao or Marco Polo Bridge. In this incident, Japanese and Chinese units engaged in separate military exercises and ended up firing at each other. This single firefight quickly spiraled into a full invasion of mainland China, the Second Sino-Japanese War had thus begun. General Tojo had a chance to test his battle skills at last. In August of 1937, he commanded an expeditionary force of 150,000 Japanese, Mongolian, and Manchurian troops into the Chahar province of Inner Mongolia. Operation Chahar was a large, enveloping movement designed to outflank Chinese troops in Peking, modern-day Beijing. Tojo deployed three mechanized brigades, but dispersed his tanks in an infantry support role. One of his subordinates, General Sakai, argued that armor was more effective in massed, concentrated attacks. He was right, but Tojo could not accept critics and had Sakai sacked. In any case, Chinese troops in the area had no tanks whatsoever, and Tojo was able to achieve victory after all. On August the 27th, his forces conquered the city of Kaogan, modern-day Zhang Jiakou. With the Inner Mongolia region under Japanese control and a victory under his belt, 
Tojo planned his next ambitious move, staging a border incident with the Soviets to spark a war with Stalin. Let's be honest about passwords. Look, either you or someone you know is using that same password for Netflix, bank account, Instagram, and half a dozen, a dozen, two dozen maybe other things. Yes, it happens. And it's even got a name, it's called credential stuffing, and it's the number one way that account hacking takes place these days. One login gets leaked onto the dark web, and suddenly everything is compromised. Yes, there are a lot of bad actors out there on the internet, but fortunately, today's video is sponsored by NordVPN, which is helping to give internet users all the tricks and tools of a proper 21st century online experience. You might have heard me talk about NordVPN before. You can encrypt your internet data and move your online activity to another location with just one click, either first superior security on new streaming options. And look, all of that is still true. NordVPN has thousands of servers spread across 59 countries. But the VPNs give you access to many more options than just new TV shows. With NordVPN, you really can do it all, and that includes utilizing their threat protection upgrade, which blocks ads, eradicates web trackers, checks for malware, and more. Right now, as part of a unique deal, you guys can get a two-year plan at a huge discount, plus an additional four months for free. And if you change your mind, they offer a 30-day money-back guarantee. All you got to do is head to nordvpn.com slash bio. Again, that's nordvpn.com slash bio for a two-year deal at a huge discount, plus four free months on top of that as a bonus. Or just follow the link in the description box below. And now today's video. A border incident did take place in July and August 1938 at Lake Kalasan, and a pretty serious one at that. 1,300 troops died on both sides, and a furious Hirohito intervened to stop the madness. But Tojo was not around at that time. In May 1938, his old boss, General Itagaki, had become Minister of War in the cabinet of Prime Minister Kono. And Itagaki needed a trusted vice minister. So, was good old Razor interested in the position? And of course he was. But this time, Tojo was not content with pushing pencils on behalf of of his boss, and he sought more visibility. In November, he addressed a conference of industrialists with a rousing nationalistic speech. His rhetoric attacked the Chinese, the British, the Americans, and especially the Soviets. He predicted that they would soon be at war with Japan. Tojo warned his audience to prioritize war preparations over civilian production in the near future. The speech made it to the papers, at home and abroad, leading to a drop in the Tokyo Stock Exchange. The Japanese parliament questioned the war and prime ministers about this faux pas. Prime Minister Kano was embarrassed by the whole debacle and ensured that Tokyo could do no harm. The general was reassigned to a non-political job in December 1938 as Inspector General of the Army Aviation. Tojo held that position until July 1940, when the then-current cabinet, led by Prime Minister Yanai, was dissolved. Kano resumed power and, uh, when appointing his new cabinet, he chose Hideki Tojo as War Minister. And this may seem counterintuitive, given the history, but the truth is that both men had much in common. They both worshipped the Emperor and both advocated for Japan to take a leading role in East Asia by creating a Greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere. But unlike Tojo, Kono had no plans to expand the conflict to other powers in the region, and he hoped to find a peaceful settlement to the Second Sino-Japanese War. But these plans would be foiled by Tojo and Foreign Minister Matsoka. Tojo intended the war to continue against China until total victory, and the major obstacle to this goal was the embargo on vital resources, especially crude oil enacted by the United States. Tojo and Matsoka therefore pressured the cabinet into forming an alliance with Nazi Germany and fascist Italy, the Tripartite Pact of September 1940, which was intended by Tojo as a guarantee against potential American aggression. Relations with Washington deteriorated further when Japanese troops moved into Indochina to cut off the Chinese army supply lines. In cooperation with the British and the Dutch governments, the US froze Japanese assets abroad, establishing an economic blockade. Kono and Emperor Hirohito considered re-establishing friendly relations with Western powers, but Tojo maintained his hard line. According to him, the only way to secure success in China and strengthen Japan for the eventual, inevitable confrontation with the Soviet Union was to strike first against America. And not only against the US, Europe had been at war since September 1939. Germany and Italy's aggression had weakened the military presence of Britain, France, and the Netherlands in Southeast Asia. As stated by Tojo in his own diary, the time was ripe to conquer their colonial holdings, seizing their bountiful oil 
at food reserves. Kono tried to persuade Tojo to seek a diplomatic solution, but facing continuous intransigence, the Prime Minister resigned in October 1941. In yet another counterintuitive move, Hirohito and his advisors appointed General Tojo as the new head of the government. They hoped that Tojo's devotion to the Emperor would eventually cause him to stop the saber rattling, but they had underestimated the Razor's determination. The new Prime Minister maintained his earlier brief as War Minister and appointed himself as Home Minister too. This move ensured he could quell any internal unrest stemming from a decision to go to war. Craftily, he sold the move as a means to quell unrest should Japan not go to war. Later, he would accumulate job titles, Minister of Education, Minister of Commerce and Industry, and Minister of Foreign Affairs. In other words, Tojo aimed to concentrate all aspects related to indoctrination, propaganda, and the conduct of the war into his hands. On November 17, 1941, Tojo dropped any pretense of seeking diplomatic terms with the United States. In a speech to Parliament, he warned any third power, for example America, from interfering in the Sino-Japanese War. Meanwhile, the Army and Navy Chiefs of Staff had been drafting plans for simultaneous attacks against U.S. bases in Pearl Harbor, the Philippines, Wake Island, and Guam. British possessions in Malá, Singapore, and Hong Kong would also be targeted. The aim was to extend Japanese defense lines well beyond their home islands in Manchukuo and to seize natural resources within these new borders. In achieving these goals through a lightning-fast victory, Tojo also hoped that Western powers would immediately capitulate. The decision to launch these attacks was taken at the Imperial Conference on December the 1st. And then came December the 7th, the day that will live in infamy. Shortly before Japan's fighter bombers mauled the U.S. Pacific Fleet at Pearl Harbor, Tojo wrote this entry in his diary. December the 7th, Sunday. Sunny. 1100 hours, consultation with Emperor, discussion of the Secretary of the Cabinet, Hoshino, and Kido, Lord Keeper of the Privy Seal, about commencement of hostilities against US, Britain, and Holland. Tojo's plan succeeded spectacularly, and Japan's sudden expansion made him immensely popular with the Japanese people. He did not shy away, however, from admitting that the war in the Pacific would be long and hard. In a speech on January the 21st, 1942, he admitted that, quote, the present war will become a prolonged one. In order to fulfill the purpose of the war, the whole nation must persevere in whatever difficulties and tribulations with a firm conviction of ultimate victory. The Prime Minister had consolidated considerable power in his hands, but he was still bound to the rules of the Imperial Constitution. This meant that he needed full support of the Parliament to sustain the war effort. Now, in theory, all political parties had been merged into an organization called Imperial Rule Assistance Association (IRAA). The aim was to create unity in the Japanese political spectrum in times of war, but the IRAA was never equivalent to a monolithic or powerful party like the Nazi or fascist parties. In fact, the majority of seats in the Japanese parliament were held by members of parliament not affiliated to the IRAA. Parliamentary elections were expected on April the 30th, 1942, and Tojo knew that he had to swing parliament's majority into the IRAA fold. To do so, he invested more than 2 million yen in bribes in newspapers and politicians, garnering support for IRAA candidates. His efforts were compounded by the shock of April the 18th's Doolittle Raid. This was a daring American bombing raid over Tokyo, which proved that the US had the will and resources to strike back. It also had the unexpected effect of stealing the Japanese people's resolve to continue fighting fighting and thus support Tojo's military policies. As a result, 381 of Tojo's pet candidates entered the Diet, securing a solid majority for the IRAA. The Doolittle Raid had also another unfortunate consequence. Most of the pilots who took part in the action crash-landed in China and were helped by civilians. Tojo's military unleashed a retaliatory campaign, torturing and murdering 250,000 Chinese civilians. Despite his electoral victory, Tojo found himself at odds with other members of the political elite. For example, following the Battle of Midway from June the 4th to the 7th, 1942, he was challenged by Foreign Minister Togo. In that battle, the Japanese Navy had been bested by its American counterpart, losing eight vessels and 250. 48 planes. Togo pointed out that the Razor, quote, was guilty of flagrant non-feasance in carrying out urgently needed moves for increasing fighting power. The Togo Tojo feud reached its climax in November 1942 when the Prime Minister created the Greater Asian Ministry, snatching the administration of occupied territories off of the hands of foreign ministry. Togo argued that this move would divide Japan's strategy in foreign affairs and challenged Tojo to resign. A cabinet crisis loomed and Hirohito intervened by asking Togo Shigenori to resign instead. The foreign ministry 
fell into the grasp of Mr. Razor. The next rival in line was the Army Chief of Staff General Sugiyama, who criticized Tojo's grand strategy for the war in the Pacific. Tojo secured the support from the Navy and excluded Sugiyama from his next plans, formalized at an Imperial Conference on December 31, 1942. On that occasion, Tojo ordered the military to abandon the defensive positions of Guadalcanal and Buna and launch an offensive against Port Moresby, Papua New Guinea. Both decisions proved to be a mistake. The former encouraged the U.S. strategy of island hopping or progressive encroaching to towards the Japanese home islands, the latter met with defeat against an Australian counter-offensive. Tojo blamed these setbacks on his lack of total authority. Military and political colleagues argued against giving him free reign, pointing out that Germany's setbacks were due to Hitler's micromanagement of all things military. Tojo replied to this, Führer Hitler was an enlisted man, I am a general. But they had a point. Concentration of power does not yield good results in times of war. Those protests fell on deaf ears, and Tojo continued to hog ministry and high-ranking positions. In April 1943, he became Minister of Education. In November, Minister of Munitions. In February 1944, Tojo appointed himself Army Chief of Staff, an open violation of the Constitution. What was worse, by absorbing all key positions, Tojo was left without scapegoats to blame for losing the war. The turning point uh, was the fall of the Pacific island of Saipan on July the 9th, 1944, a disastrous defeat. The Jushin, a privy council of elder statesmen, advised Hirohito to remove Tojo from power, and the emperor delivered. Tojo was forced to resign and retire from the army on July the 20th. Had he not resigned, an army major, Sonoda, was ready to assassinate him with a potassium cyanide bomb. It was customary for former prime ministers to immediately join the Jushin, but Hirohito did not invite Tojo until February 1945, which may have been a calculated slight. Even after joining the Privy Council, it was clear that the Razor had lost his slashing power. Following the fall of yet another prime minister in April 1945, Tojo put forward a candidate friendly to the army, but his plans were quashed by the intervention of Navy Admiral Okada. He was less amenable to a continuation of the war at any cost, a war that, despite Japan's strenuous resistance, was all but lost. The Allies had taken almost all of their territories. China's forces were on the rise. Hiroshima and Nagasaki suffered the first ever atomic bombings in history. And if that wasn't enough, on August the 9th, Tojo's nemesis, the Soviet Union, finally invaded Manchuria in force. In an unprecedented act, on August the 15th, 1945, Emperor Hirohito spoke on the radio, announcing Japan's surrender on September the 2nd. As the Allies began the occupation of Japan, Tojo retreated to his private home, conscious he would soon be arrested for his involvement in war crimes. The former general considered committing suicide for some time, but was dissuaded by the new war minister, Shimomura. Shimomura advised Tojo to postpone his deed until he had taken responsibility for starting the war, thus sparing the emperor from going to trial. But on September the 11th, 1945, as occupation authorities and journalists gathered outside his home, Tojo decided to act. He asked a doctor to mark the location of his heart with ink, and then he fired a shot with his service pistol. The bullet barely missed the heart, and American military doctors managed to save his life. He would go on trial as a Class A defendant in front of the International Military Tribunal for the Far East for war crimes. Proceedings began on May 3, 1946, with questioning conducted by Chief Prosecutor Joseph Keenan. International observers remarked how Tojo defended himself with dignity, initially asserting that Japan was innocent of aggression as war had been forced upon its people. As the trial continued, Tojo gradually admitted responsibility for ordering the December 1941 attacks, claiming that the emperor was blameless. He initially rejected charges of cruelty against prisoners of war, claiming that they endured the same hardships as the average Japanese soldier. But in this case, he eventually admitted responsibility. This was another move to protect the emperor from prosecution. The trial ended on November the 11th, 1948, with a conviction for crimes against peace, crimes against humanity, and war crimes. The sentence, death by hanging, to be carried out on December the 23rd. American occupation authorities kept his place of burial a well-guarded secret for decades, wary that it may become a rallying point for Japanese ultranationalists. Only in June 2021 was it revealed that Tojo's remains had been cremated and his ashes scattered over the Pacific Ocean.